Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new edition of Seniors Views. Tonight, our guest is Ted Shaw. Ted started his career in journalism with the Chatham Daily News in 1975. Two years later, he moved to the Windsor Star in its Chatham Bureau from fall 1977 to spring 1978. He was then called to the home newsroom, the home office in Windsor, where he covered general assignment stories, education, and police. And then in 1981, he was invited to do some entertainment writing and reviewing. He was the star's classical music critic for 15 years. His main focus was on music, pop, classical, jazz, and TV. His life as a reviewer and critic is our topic tonight. Uh, criticism of uh, television and music then and now. And he retired in 2015. Tonight we'll talk about criticism then and now, as I just said, and what adventures he had covering the entertainment business. Ted, welcome and thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for asking me, Rob. Uh, first, a, a few personal facts just so our audience uh, can uh, 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 oh, you got a dog in the background. You got a dog, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's part of your family. But first, <laughs> uh, so that's one personal fact. Uh, where, were, where were you born and uh, where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Montreal for the first 10 months of my life I was there. And then uh, my family moved back to Toronto where they were from. And that's, uh, I grew up in Toronto and the suburbs of Toronto. And uh, that's basically uh, tells the story of the first 25 years of my life. And then I, uh, before, until I got a job. Uh, where did you go to school? I went to the University of Toronto and I went to, I got a bachelor in uh, English literature. And then I went to uh, a, a place called Air, uh, it's oak. It's an oak. It's a. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a uh, community school in a, in Oakville that uh, pandered to uh, journalism students, people interested in getting into journalism, and it was run by uh, several former Toronto Star writers. And I uh, went there for a year, and while there, I made contact with a uh, with an editor at the Chatham Daily News, which was a Thompson paper. And um, I didn't really know where Chatham was. I you know, grew up in the Toronto area and everything past London was like dark zone to me. Yeah, you're and, and, the center of the universe. <laughs> exactly. So I, uh, I got, I contacted him. He was quite pleased that uh, at, in those days, a lot of journalists, a lot of reporters got their start by doing odd jobs in the newsroom, like copy boys. And they didn't have the formal schooling of education or of journalism. And um, so this editor was more than happy to give me an interview when he found out I had a degree from the University of Toronto. He invited me down. He, um, he told me that uh, I would be doing general reporting and uh, that I would be covering all kinds of, of stories. I would be doing police, education, covering uh, boards of education meetings and uh, everything except what I ended up doing at the Windsor Star, which is or, uh, entertainment. But I, uh, I, got a, I worked there for 15 months and uh, part of that six, the first six months was in the uh, Wallaceburg Bureau of the Chatham News. And I'll tell you, that was an experience. They uh, provided me with a car and I drove all over Lambton County and um, got to know Lambton and Kent County quite well by driving around. It was a, uh, you know, only one newspaper in the area. And at that time, actually, the Windsor Star had a bureau in Chatham, but uh, I didn't have near enough uh, experience to go there. But after 15 months, I actually got a call from the, uh, the bureau manager for the, uh, the Chatham Bureau for the Windsor Star. And he uh, asked me if I'd be interested in, 
in uh, checking them out. And uh, I hesitated because I had this job. I was quite, quite happy with it. And uh, then he said, well, what do you make? And I said, I make uh, $150 a week. And he says, well, would you like to double that and come over to see us? I said, when do you want me to start? <laughs> and and uh, that's how I got it. I got my job at the uh, Windsor Star uh, in the Chatham Bureau. And I worked there for about six months. And then I was called into the city. And uh, what did you do when you started at the Windsor Star? Uh, I covered uh, police, as you mentioned, police and fire. I chased ambulances, as they say in the business. And um, I enjoyed that. I would also cover a lot of agriculture stories because Chatham is in the middle of a very profitable agricultural area. And uh, I would go out to, to uh, farms. I remember one visit I made to a, uh, an onion farm. And uh, this was in reclaimed land south of uh, Chatham. And uh, as soon as you got near the farm, you could smell the onion in the air. And uh, I went to visit the, the owner of the farm and his farmhouse. And he says, would you like a sip of my liqueur? And I said, well, I'm on the job. He <laughs> says, no, but you got to have this. It's onion liqueur. And I'll tell you, I've never tasted onion liqueur. It sounds horrible, but it I've does. never tasted anything so good. So I sat there and had a, did an interview with him for about an hour. And uh, we uh, sipped uh, onion liqueur for, oh, for several wow. minutes. And, uh, but you know, a lot, there were a lot of things like that. Like I didn't, I never felt as if like I was a, an interloper or somebody from the big city, you know, they, I, I was greeted with open arms by all those people. And, uh, and I still, uh, to this day, I really, uh, I really uh, miss and I reminisce about the, uh, the days in Chatham. Did you spend a lot of time, uh, every spring on the, uh, Thames river floods? Oh, yeah, that was an annual affair, um, which you're probably quite aware of. I, uh, yes. um, I never actually got out into the flooded areas, but we had a uh, pretty good photography staff. And I, I would go out in the squad car with them, but I would do my, uh, my stories from the uh, safety of the, uh, of the car, occasionally getting out and interviewing people who were, you know, victims of the flood. But... Um, no, I was a, uh, I remember one time the, uh, and people in this area will relate to this. We, it was uh, in third week of January and we were heading out to a, um, I forget what exactly the story was, but we were heading out to uh, the county and um, we, we were caught in the middle of a violent winter storm and the, uh, the car stalled. We sat, we sat in the car in the middle of this basically nowhere, wind sweeping past and snow drifts building up. And uh, I thought, boy, this is the end. I'm not gonna see anything more of my, of my family. <laughs> but uh, eventually the, uh, the police arrived, they towed us out of there. And uh, it was certainly an experience to uh, give a firsthand uh, account of being caught in a snow snow drift in a snowstorm because as it turned out i was in several snowstorms after that yeah part of the uh the profession i guess exactly yeah, yeah. we always go uh, i'm speaking as a reporter too for those who don't know me i was a reporter as well and we usually we're always running towards the disaster when everybody's running away exactly I remember when the, uh, do you remember the Essex explosion? Yeah. I mean, we, we recently Valentine's had Valentine's Day, 1980. Yeah, we, exactly. We recently had Kingsville blow up in basically the same way. They're still trying to figure out why that happened. Or Wheatley. Wheatley. Wheatley, that's right. And, um, but I remember going out there and it was, uh, we could see, as we were, it, was, it was dark. It was just getting dark. And uh, I was heading out there with my photographer, uh, Tim McKenna, who ultimately went to the Hamilton Spectator. I'm not sure if he's, he's probably retired now. But we were uh, driving down this county road and we could see this orange sky ahead of us from all the flames in the town of Essex. And um, it was quite the experience because you know, as 
happened in Wheatley. It was a, a, a gas line explosion. It was a uh, <laughs> something that the, uh, I think a truck or something backed into the gas line. And uh, right. the, uh, I was running around trying to find people <laughs> who were victims of this. And Tim was running around trying to get pictures. And uh, it was, uh, you know, for, for somebody who at that time, I only had like what, five years experience and I had never <clears throat> had any experience doing this before. And it was, it was a learning experience for sure all, all the time. And it was, uh, um, it was, nonetheless, it was great fun. It was great. Like I say fun. I mean, it was a disaster, right? But it was great. It was, for yeah. me, it was a great, it was a great time. Yeah, I think you learn quickly that the story is about the people. Yeah, and, that's exactly uh, you, right. You go from the the big story to the individual stories, and that's what people relate to. One time out in the county, Rob, I uh, I went to a <clears throat> as you probably are aware, or you probably covered a lot of uh, level crossing accidents in the county. A lot of uh, level Railroad crossings don't have don't have gates or don't have the swing uh, gates on them. And in this one case, this uh, pickup truck was hit by a train in the middle of the night. <clears throat> and um, so I went out there. I was roaming around in the, in the dark, and all of a sudden, the policeman said, "You better watch out, sir." And I said, "Why?" And he says, "Well, there's a body bag right where you're walking." I almost walked on a body bag. Now that, you know, oh, that, yeah. that you know, brought a lump to my throat right there. That and, would do uh, it. The, uh, anyway, if there, you know, it sounds morbid to say that, but it's just, that's one of the things you do. And, uh, right. So anyway, uh, it, was, it was an experience. And, and sooner or later, you got to, to the home office at the Windsor Star. Yeah. And after covering... You said education, police, fire, all the things that uh, they try us out on first to make That's sure we can bear <laughs> it. That's right. Uh, you Tell us about how you became a, a critic and a reviewer in arts. Well, some of the viewers may, may remember John Laycock. He's like a legend in, uh, as a movie reviewer in Windsor and Essex County. He was the uh, entertainment editor at the time. And uh, he said, I need somebody to go and cover a rock concert at the uh, Cleary, you know, the Chrysler Theater now. And it was a Canadian rock band. And um, boy, I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, he didn't have anybody and he didn't want to go because he didn't really know the music. And he says, I know that you covered music when you were in uh, the University of Toronto, and I did. I covered music for the Varsity, the newspaper, student newspaper in, in the University of Toronto. So I had a little experience doing that. And I said, yeah, sure. And I had uh, quite an extensive record collection. So I, that was my first assignment. I got a job covering this, uh, um, covering this band that, uh, and um, it was, uh, Fun. It was enjoyable, and it was that the fact that it was at the Chrysler Theater, I didn't have to go very far. All these, most of the assignments after that were in uh, Detroit, and uh, until the casino opened in Windsor here, and then I got to cover a lot of events in my hometown. I, I know that this was a highly anticipated injury. I got notes from all your friends across the country, literally across the country, <laughs> Ted. So now we're getting into the part that I think they, they really want to hear about. I hope, and, I hope some uh, of them were nice, nice things they said. Yeah, mostly nice things. Even <laughs> the ones who disagreed said you were nice about it. But uh, uh, what we were talking about before uh, we were so rudely interrupted, uh, how did you become a critic? Well, as I mentioned, uh, John Laycock uh, asked me to cover uh, a Canadian band at the uh, Cleary Auditorium. And uh, I was familiar with the band. I can't remember the name. I tried, I tried to think of it while we were off there. 
And um, if I do, if I do remember, I'll mention it later on. But anyway, wasn't the that, Beatles? Though. It wasn't, it wasn't the Beatles. Beatles. I, uh, I unfortunately, I never did see the Beatles, and uh, it's one of the uh, low points of my uh, career. I never saw the Beatles, but uh, I did see the Rolling Stones a few times, and I saw um, well, lots of lots of classic bands. So um, the uh, that was it. I, I started in, I forget what year it was, maybe 80, 81. And, um, and then after that, I, I, the, uh, the television critic, Tom McMahon at the time, got uh, appointed as uh, entertainment editor. And uh, John Laycock had been doing it, but he decided he didn't want to be the editor anymore. So he, uh, so Tom took over as editor, which meant that he didn't, every year Tom would take uh, trips down to Los Angeles to see the upcoming shows in the fall. And uh, that's what I did for about five years. I would uh, fly out of Detroit down to Los Angeles in the um, early summer. And uh, they would, the networks, most, it was mostly just the, the big three networks, ABC, CBS and, uh, and NBC, later followed by some of the digital services, but uh, Fox came on a little later and they would bring out their, uh, the show, the fall schedules and show the critics samples of them, uh, whole episodes that had been completed. In some cases, some hadn't been completed. And they would also bring out the stars of the shows to be interviewed in large uh, group sessions. So that was a lot of fun. I did that. Um, I remember interviewing uh, George Clooney um, in a, a session. He had long, long hair and he would play the doctor. I forget the name of the series. ER. Yeah, that's right, ER. And he, uh, he was actually, I mean, everybody kind of thought, uh, not a bad looking guy, but he wasn't anywhere near what you would imagine he, he, what he would become, like a ma major matinee idol. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting uh, experience. What, what was he like? He was very nice. Yeah. And uh, of course, his mother is a famous uh, person. His uh, aunt, Rosemary his aunt, Clooney. Rosemary Clooney, that's right. Yes. So he, he had uh, um, entertainment in his background. You know? And his father was first an anchor man. And then he became either a congressman. I think he was a congressman from Tennessee. Oh, okay. You should be doing this. No, no, no. It's just... <laughs> just uh, you happen to know about that. Yeah, I just happen to know about that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there goes our dog again. He, um... <laughs> Hold a second. I'm just going to close the door here. Okay. So for those just tuning in, we're talking to Ted Shaw live, and he's closing the door for the dog. There's a door, there's a dog outside that he's barking at. You can hear him. Yes. They, these things tend to happen during live uh, yeah. webinars. And I have a cat right beside me here who's about to walk on the keyboard, I think. But <laughs> I, think I think the dog woke her up. Anyway, anyway, a lot of my, a lot of my uh, more memorable experiences were doing those interviews uh, in so Los Angeles. So set the stage for me. You, uh, they'd send you down there for uh, junkets? To... Yeah, it would be uh, like 10 days. And, and how many stars would you do in 10 days? Oh, geez. 50, maybe 50. And they were all in, in groups. In small groups and large groups, the largest group I did was only one star, and that was Tom Selleck, Magnum PI. Yeah, and, you're getting all the all the matinee idols yeah. out of the way here. Well, this was I think it was the final season of that show, and um, he was very famous among the critics for being a super nice guy. And so everybody wanted to come to the uh, Tom Selleck interview because he's such a nice guy. Well, it turned out 
he wasn't actually on the premises. He did a uh, he did an interview from the set of Hawaii of, of Magnum PI in Hawaii on a very large screen. But as we were walking into the uh, interview room, it was like a large uh, ballroom actually, and there must have been oh. 150 critics and 150 uh, um, better halves who accompanied them. So oh, were, yeah. Wanted you know, there were a lot of people. Look at them. Yeah. And um, as we were walking in, CBS, the, uh, the network, distributed uh, Hawaiian shirts to everybody who walked through the door. Really? So, yeah. So we. Uh, we all put, they were, we were instructed before the interview started to put on a Hawaiian shirt. And I'll tell you, when he came up on the screen, he was totally amazed and, and flabbergasted. He started laughing out loud and he thought that was the greatest thing he'd seen in, in a long, long time. All like 150, 300 people wearing Hawaiian shirts. I still have that someplace. You do. It's probably a collector's item now. It is, yeah. I uh, had a similar experience with him. They sent me out to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. He, he, when he came to Detroit, he used to go to AA meetings. He never missed his meetings. And beautiful young women would line yeah. up outside the church where the church basement or the community center, somehow they would find out where he was when he was in yeah, town. Of course. Yeah. Cause he was from Detroit at one. I, I don't yeah. know if he was born there, but he was from Detroit. He had lived in Detroit. So Big fan of the tigers. Yeah. 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 That's right. He used, used to wear he, the that's why tigers he wore the, the tigers yeah. hat, which increased yeah. their sales immensely. <laughs> uh, worldwide because of him yeah uh, but uh, I remember having to line up outside this AA meeting waiting for him to come out so people would ask him for his autograph and stuff like that he was always he was quite embarrassed I thought yeah but I uh, think he, yeah I think he uh, he he's such a down-to-earth person I think all that adulation may have been a little bit too much for him you know yeah he was more of a more of a private person which um i actually that day that we did this interview a couple of women said to me that he had done interviews before but he was hard to convince to come out to them because of the fact that there were all these people who wanted to see him press palms and uh but this one was a was a bit of a difference because he was at one remove. He was in a on a video screen. So well, while we're on the subject of uh, stars, uh, in your in your bio to me, you said you met Sophia Loren. Yes, that's true. She was, uh, and I was sitting uh, as close to her as I am to this video screen and watching you on, and uh, it was. <laughs> I was, uh, my breath was taken away. I mean, she's just so stunningly beautiful. But even in her six, she was in her, what? She would have been in her late 60s then. Um, but she was um, hawking a uh, perfume or some kind of uh, cologne or something. And she had, but she had also appeared in a, uh, in a movie on one of the networks. I can't remember which one. And uh, it was just a very brief appearance. But because she was involved with this, uh, perfume uh, she agreed to come out to the interview and uh, she was a very gracious person you could tell that she had been interviewed many many times in her life she just seemed to be uh, so relaxed among all of these people that she didn't know from Adam you know she'd never met them before they're all North American journalists and she uh, but she just seemed so cool and collected that uh, it was quite uh, quite an experience. I became a more of a fan than I was before. <laughs> yes, yes. They uh, when you realize they're humans like you. Exactly. But you know, it's funny because later on, much later on, when I was covering music, I was uh, I was at uh, 
Meadowbrook Music Theater covering a Stevie Wonder concert. And um, somebody from the, from the people who brought him in there came up to my seat, or my, actually I was sitting on the grass there, and asked if I would like to come back after the show. And I very seldom accepted invitations like that, mainly because I, I was on a clock. I had to get back and write the review and I didn't want to waste time or not waste time, but spend too much time hobnobbing in the back with backstage. But this time, I mean, Stevie Wonder, I wasn't going to pass that up. And there's a, there again, there's a guy that so down to earth, so gracious. And um, again, he's, you know, he's one of these people who has been interviewed countless times and he just knew how to handle a group of people. But he was also very giving with his time. And I, I became, well, I was already a big fan, but I became even more so when, when I saw him. Okay, now it's time. I started it, but we went, we went into television and yeah. I'll ask you more about that in a few minutes, but the criticism, you were a, a, a reviewer and critic for music. Yes. Now, now what, what did you have to do to prepare yourself for that? That's a, a whole different thing than just being a journalist and reporter. Well, it's funny, Rob, uh, you know, you mentioned a reporter. I used to say to people that uh, as much as I did, as much as I voiced my opinion of these concerts, I also reported on them. And so I would try to give a little bit of a feel for what the crowd was like, uh, you know, the size of the crowd, the venue itself, uh, you know, if it was that pine knob, whether it was pouring rain or it was, you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it was uh, part of the job. I, you know, I, I think probably because I started out as a reporter, I uh, continued as a reporter covering entertainment. And uh, I think it helped, stood me in good stead. Um, it certainly helped with my interviews. Most of my interviews were, uh, were done on a phone. So when you do interviews on the phone, you've got to be able to ask questions that they can relate to, you know? And, and I think that uh, covering a concert was, a, uh, was something that I love to do. I have to say that since, uh, since I've retired, I, I mean, I used to always get the best seats in the house. And, right. <laughs> and yeah. um, since I've retired, because a lot of people still know me, they still like, especially at the casino, I'll get really good seats at the casino, but I don't want to go as much. It's, it's funny. I kind of got that out of my system, you know, going to concerts. And I think a lot of it was because once the con when the concert was over, my day as a reporter began, I had to right. go back to the office and write the review. And sometimes the reviews came really easily. If I knew an artist, um, say like, I don't know, Paula Notes or something. If I knew that artist and I had all kinds of their albums, it was easy for me to write about them. Um, but uh, sometimes it just didn't come. And, uh, you know, writer's block. I mean, we've all experienced that. And I would have, uh, I'd have to, to, excuse me, I'd have to um, kind of I'd take my time. Sometimes I was the last person in the newsroom writing my review. And, uh, but uh, how was the reaction to some of those reviews? Did you get any uh, like we'll talk about classical music because you did that for 15 years. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's hard to criticize Bach and uh, Tchaikovsky. But uh, you, uh, you, you uh, criticize the performers. Of Bach I know that's my it's a little joke, just a little yeah. joke. But uh, but with. Uh, uh, rock stars, they can be pretty thin skinned, the ones I've talked to over the years. I, uh, yeah, the, the Windsor Star in their mind is pretty small potatoes. I mean, if I worked for the Toronto Star or uh, the Detroit Free Press, they might have had a reaction. But generally, once you reach a certain point in your career, I remember, I don't know if you remember, but just a few years ago, uh, Elton John appeared at the WFCU Center here in Windsor. And um, he, I reviewed that show. I didn't hear anything back, but I did hear 
from the promoter that he quite enjoyed the uh, the experience. He enjoyed the review, and uh, you know, it was another case of I knew him as a excuse me, I knew his work for years and years and years. So writing a review was pretty easy for me. Like I had it once at one. I don't still have them, but I. I had at one point about 3,000 albums, and um, most of the record albums I've got rid of, and I've replaced a lot of them with CDs. But uh, I, you know, I just knew the music. I just had been collecting since I was a, a teen, and uh, it was just uh, something that was part of me. And uh, the only time I got a really negative review was when I, uh, actually twice, I got a. I did a neg negative review of, uh, what's her name, Simpson, uh, Jennifer, Jessica Simpson. Yes. And uh, I said that she, uh, she looked like a dancing bear on stage. She just couldn't, she had virtually no charisma as a performer on stage. You know, I'd seen the best. I saw like... Um, uh, well, David Bowie. I mean, he's amazing on stage, and uh, uh, the but and Michael Jackson. Now, Michael Jackson was just amazing as a performer on stage, but the uh, she just had no charisma, and she just didn't seem to be. She just didn't seem to be in her element there. Her singing wasn't bad, but then I criticized her, and uh, I had all these uh, Jessica Simpson fans dump all over me in letters to the editor. The other time I got negative response was when I uh, reviewed Gordon Lightfoot. And I love Gordon Lightfoot. I've loved, loved him ever since I was a kid. But I just happened to mention that he was showing his age. And so this woman wrote in, she says, you've got a lot to criticize him about showing your age, judging by your photo. And I thought, <laughs> well, <thanks." laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, so... You know, it's it, it, it made me realize, and I, I, I realized this over the years, that people take their reviews to heart. I mean, these are people, if they didn't go to the show, they want to read about it and see what happened. And that's the, those are the people I was writing about. Those are the people I was reporting to. And uh, they are like such important figures in their lives. I mean, you know, people, music to people is so vital and it, it's a uh, it's something that I mean I kind of had a responsibility really to uh, to be honest about my reviews but also to, to give people what they really wanted and that was a fair assessment of it and I think uh, when it comes right down to it is you know if you are fair people will will see that if you're not and uh, another time I wasn't as exactly fair, Anytime I had any, every time I criticized something physical about an, about a performer, I was, and I felt really badly about it afterwards. But the uh, the Spice Girls, there's one Spice Girl who's quite chubby, and I men mentioned that in, in the review stupidly. I shouldn't have done it, but then I got all this negative feedback from people. Right. And um, so that taught me just, just you know, don't. Deal with the music. Don't deal with the physical aspects because people, uh, you know, don't really care about that. They just want to hear the music. So, so anyway. how did you review classical music? That had to be difficult. You know, I first started at university. As I mentioned before, I wrote for the uh, the University of Toronto Press, the Varsity, and um, my first concert for the that I reviewed for them was the uh, Toronto Mendelssohn Choir at Massey Hall. And uh, John Laycock saw that. He says, well, would you like to do some stuff to fill in for Harry Van Voigt, who for years and years and years, viewers will remember Harry as the, the classical music critic for the Windsor Star. Well, I would fill in for him. And I, uh, and I love classical music. I have a lot of it in my collection. And uh, I, he uh, would ask me occasionally if I'd be interested in going to orchestra hall uh, and uh, to cover something and I jumped at the chance and in the uh, the Windsor Symphony I did I interviewed uh, all of the uh, 
all of the conductors for the symphony, the maestros. I uh, got to know Susan Hay quite well when she was here. Um, her follower was uh, John Morris Russell. And uh, that was an interesting experience because they, uh, they auditioned for him by uh, inviting several of their top choices to uh, come and conduct one concert each. And uh, I knew from the very first concert that he conducted that he was the guy. And uh, sure enough, he, they did give him the job. So I covered him for about, oh, nine, 10 years. And he got this really prestigious job at the Cincinnati Orchestra as the, uh, the pops conductor there. And it's like one of the premier positions in, uh, in music in the United States. And he's from Cincinnati, so it was uh, another double coup for him. But anyway, that's uh, I, I just listening. Um, both my daughters perform uh, violin and piano, so I had that. Uh, in my background as well. And uh, I would just uh, bone up on, you know, on the uh, artist. Quite often I would interview the, uh, the visiting artist before he or she came. And sometimes I would uh, just, you know, read up on, on, the, on the, uh, the piece. So it was, a, it was a kind of a, you know, labor of love for me. I just, I just uh, love, covering classical music. What can I say? I just, you know, what, what's, the, what's not to like, Rob? That's right. <laughs> That's right. I, I was a regular at the symphony for years and years myself. Uh, I got a question from the audience. Uh, Ted, how do you think being a critic has changed with the rise of social media? Oh, um... being a critic. I think uh, it has changed in the sense that now, I used to say everybody's a critic. Well, now everybody can be a critic and put it on, on uh, Facebook. Like, like us on Zoom. Yeah, like us, exactly. And, um, and it's instantaneous. Uh, um, my reviews would appear usually the day after. Well, that, now you can just comment on something that happened 10 minutes ago. And uh, I think that uh, it has changed somewhat. Um, there are uh, not as many, at least in newspapers the size of the Windsor Star, there aren't as many critics anymore. And uh, I think probably it's because of uh, social media. I think there, you know, people have other forms of input and they can, um, uh, Unless you you know you're a real follower of a certain critic, um, it, there are lots of other ways to get your uh, you know get your your uh, your jolt from uh, music. So I, I think I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think that's probably part of the uh, part of the reason it's uh, well, a lot, and a lot of it, I, you know, I don't want to get into uh, economics, but a lot of it is the, uh, my job didn't uh, last much beyond my, uh, my leaving. They still have somebody who, who does uh, occasional interviews with musicians or they don't do reviews anymore, uh, but they do interviews with people ahead of time. And it became uh, quite, it, even while I was at the Windsor Star, there was a, a need or a hunger for interviews rather than reviews. And I think nice. uh, I, I don't know, I, I didn't mind doing either. I really right. enjoyed doing the interviews. Um, even if 90% um, of them were done on the phone, I would learn about an artist, something that I had never heard before. Um, and I would, I, I have to say that I, I, I uh, I think I must have been a pretty good interviewer because a lot of times the artist would say, well, this has been very enjoyable. Thank you. And you can imagine like somebody like, I don't know, pick a name, uh, uh, Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden. I had about an hour's conversation with that guy. He's got a PhD in history and sociology. Like the guy is brilliant. And yet he writes, he writes and sings music like heavy metal music. And, um, 
at the end of it, he was quite, uh, um, he, he offered quite a few uh, comments about my, my interview and he said that my, you know, the, the questions were smart and uh, showed some, some uh, thought. And, uh, but that was because as you get to do the interview, as you get to know the artist, even over the phone, you get to sense what they're like and have a feeling for who they are. And uh, that was one of my favorite parts of the job was doing the interview and learning about people, uh, famous people. Does anybody stick out as uh, the coolest celebrity you've talked to? I knew you were going to ask that. Everybody asked me. Um, it's actually a question from the audience as well. Yeah. Um, what would I say? Odds are they're not watching. Right? <laughs> so I can badmouth them as much as I want. Yeah, there you go. Uh, there are some that I didn't like doing interviews with. I, I didn't like the interview at all, but there are others that I really enjoyed. Um, you know who I really liked was... Uh, um, Canadian singer, what's her name? Uh, Mary Tale, uh, Elvis Costello. Um, oh, uh, yes. Uh, Out in Vancouver. Uh, yeah. She was she was very nice. And then I I went to do her uh, concert. It was at Orchestra Hall. Right. And and uh, she had this awful habit. She has this long blonde hair, beautiful woman, but she has this long blonde hair and she plays a piano. And every so often she whip her hair back to get it right. out of her face. And it was so distracting. She was a great performer, but I mean, that was so distracting. I didn't mention it because as I said before, I tended to stay away from doing anything, but, you know, as a physical criticism. But um, uh, anyway, that was... Uh, she was one of my favorites. Uh, I wish I could remember her name now. Boy, you get older and you forget all this stuff. Um, I really uh, enjoyed a lot of the interviews in Los Angeles. Um, I, uh, I interviewed uh, the late Peggy Lipton. Diana Kroll. Kroll. Diane, Diana Kroll, yeah. Yes. I interviewed the late Peggy Lipton when she was uh, oh yes appearing on um, uh, what's that show called uh, Twin Peaks. She was on the cast of Twin Peaks. Yeah, and that session for Twin Peaks was quite amazing. It was held in the uh, held in the luncheonette of a of a swanky hotel in uh, Beverly Hills, and. Uh, all of the uh, stars were like Kyle McLaughlin, uh, you know, Peggy Lipton, quite a few other people, including a Canadian actor, I forget his name now, would mill around and they'd actually be drinking coffee and you'd walk up to them and say hello. But Peggy was such a nice person. And, I, and a lot of people didn't know her. A lot of the younger uh, critics had no idea that she'd been on this other Mod show. Squad. Mod or, Squad. Exactly. Mod Squad way yeah. back. And, uh, but they had no idea that she'd been on that. And so they were kind of, a, you know, avoiding her. And, and you know, it was, uh, it was quite a, quite, that was quite an experience. I liked that one. Um, was David Lynch there? You know what? He was there, but I never actually got to talk to him. And uh, that's a regret of mine. Uh, there were so many other people there uh, and, um, he was there and I, I think at one point I was going to over, going over to talk to him, but there was this large clutch of reporters surrounding him. So I never actually talked to David Lynch. I have the same regret. I saw him in Toronto during, uh, it was the Toronto Film Festival, but I was just up there for CBC, uh, training. Yeah. And we went to the sandwich place where you sort of make your own sandwiches. I forget the name of the restaurant, if it still mm -hmm. exists. And uh, David Lynch was sitting about as close as I am to you on the screen. 
yeah away from me at the next and my legs turned to lead i could not move <laughs> to go over and say you're my favorite director yeah you're nuts right like i he's, love the he, guy he is nuts but uh... you know because he uh i just and i still regret that to this day that i didn't say hello to him even if they say it's you shouldn't meet all your idols because sometimes you're disappointed yeah you know, like i interviewed a well i won't mention his name <laughs> yeah he was a hockey player that i idolized and he was a great disappointment to me but i i think when you're talking about the economics of newspapers and social media that type of thing you got paid to go to concerts you got paid to go to hollywood is, do you see that happening anymore or is is that a lost uh, profession a lost uh, thing because you got entertainment tonight you got all these uh, uh you know entertainment shows access hollywood that kind of stuff yeah i thought you were going down the road of uh, did you ever feel as if you were bought off but uh you know because there was a time before i became a critic that uh, a lot of uh, newspapers got free tickets. The Windsor Star insisted on buying all of their tickets. And for the reason that they felt if I was going to review it and if I was going to say something bad, I didn't want to have to feel they had to explain it to anybody. And so they, they bought it. But in the years before I became a critic, it was de rigueur to get free tickets, and, you know, um, and all the uh, critics would go, uh, the, not just the critics, but the entertainment editors would get free tickets. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was, it, there was a hangover uh, initially when I was doing the job of a couple of the old school people who uh, said, you don't want to pay for this, do you? And I said, well, that's uh, the policy is the policy is I pay for the tickets. Well, that's just kind of a headache, you know, Ted, because then we have to account for that in our uh, bookkeeping. And I, yeah. said, I said, well, that's your problem. I'm going to pay for it. If you, don't, if you want to pocket the money, go ahead. But I'm going to, I'm going to pay for the ticket. So I, I did have a couple of experiences like that, which is kind of funny. But We, um, had, we had a similar uh, policy at CBC we had to pay because mm -hmm. somebody had... Uh, I don't know, CBC did something in a bigger story and hired, a, I think it was in Sudbury and it was a story about Inco and we got a free helicopter. So after that, we had to pay for everything. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, just in closing, uh, do you think uh, there's a, I often ask this uh, because uh do you think young people do you think there's still an opportunity to get into this somehow uh oh, yeah I, I i do how so how so well i think first of all you have to <coughs> excuse me you have to learn uh you learn have to learn how to put words together it's not an it's not as easy as it looks i have to say that and a lot of people think oh she's critics i mean geez you know you go and you say what you think about a show and that's it and you get tickets and but it's not that easy. And uh, it's not easy to write so that people actually, you know, people actually understand what you're saying. I used to have a, a style in my, uh, uh, in my features that I would uh, always close off a feature with a kind of, not punchline so much, but I'd give it a rounded end. And uh, because a lot of times you'll read a newspaper article and it just stops, like almost in the middle of a sentence. It just, it doesn't go on. I felt that was an injustice to the reader and I would try to add a little bit more to it, you know? And um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're interested in journalism, there's certainly uh, ways to get into it. And I think the journalism schools do offer um, classes for critics and uh it's a it's not a it's not the kind of a job that there's there's not a lot of them around but 
if you uh, wait long enough or you get into a newspaper and you uh, sort of you just, you want something bad, badly enough, you'll be, you'll be able to do it. And I think uh, it's, you know, I don't believe in this uh, idea that there aren't any jobs anymore for young people because it's, at least in journalism, granted there are fewer jobs in journalism, but there are still, they still are there. And I think that, you know, it's, um, it's something that I think if you really have a desire to do it, I mean, there are lots of outlets. You could write for a student newspaper. You could write for a magazine. Um, you could supply articles, uh, freelance articles to newspapers. And uh, you kind of get your foot in the door that way. You know, I think it's a, there are lots of ways to do it. And uh, I think you, you, it's, it's not something that is a completely out of the range of most people. I think if you have a talent to write, then... Uh, I think those jobs will uh, eventually open up to you. Okay. Well, Ted, on behalf of the, the people who hung on with us and uh, <laughs> the, the people who will see an edited version of this, cutting out the 10 minutes of my face being frozen on the screen, I'm told. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't a whole 10 minutes. Uh, well, it's just the first couple of minutes. <laughs> our our technician told me that while I was rebooting uh, my computer that I was uh, frozen face. But anyway, that happens on network TV these days anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And, and I'm sure all the people who eagerly anticipated this, they'll be watching it again once we edit it and uh, upload it onto our website, uh, Seniors Views. Yeah. And also, just to let you know, we won't be on next Monday because it's Thanksgiving, but the okay. week after our guest is going to be an old friend of yours, I'm sure, uh, at least an interviewee at some point, Dave Cook. Oh, great. He used to be the MPP for Windsor Riverside, Windsor St. Clair, former uh, cabinet minister in the Bob Ray government uh, and uh, a big he, part of the casino being here providing concerts for you. Yeah, well, he was an avid reader and he read all of my reviews from the casino and uh, the Windsor Symphony. I think he was, you know, he just followed my uh, career. So thank you. Thanks for your patience of hanging on with us. And thank you uh, to the audience for hanging well, on with us. Uh, thanks, Rob. I enjoyed this. I did too. Thanks a lot, Ted. Okay, cheers.